house, that you're able to travel and that you meet a lot of people, yeah. and that's how they define success. If that's success to some people, then, you know, I do have all those things. But to me, what success is, is reaching your goals. And in that sense, I have so much more to admire of you than of myself. Um, I always had this hang-up because I, did, I never finished college. I never got my degree in journalism. I went to community college and I studied marketing. And then I went back to school and I studied broadcast journalism for, at UCLA for two years. So I never actually finished. It was two years community service, but I, I mean community college, and, but I, I never finished. And I always had a hang-up about that. Uh, and my boss, after 20 years that I always talked about the hang-up that I had, he said, you know, relax. You have so much experience that right now you could have a doctorate degree, the equivalent to a doctorate degree. So, you know, relax. <laughs> so that's why, you know, you guys studied so much since kindergarten, you know, K through 12. You made it to some of the best universities in the country. Uh, in many cases, under difficult circumstances, you know, um, confronting adversity. So the word success defines each and every one of you here because you had a goal and you reached your goal. That, to me, is what success is. So that's why I wanted to come to, to talk to you. That's why, to me, it was important to try to make some time in the schedule, um, you know, to get up at 5 in the morning so I could take the flight and be here and I'll go back tonight because tomorrow morning I have another flight. But you know what? It's worth it because I get to talk to a group of students that inspire me um, right now, my daughters are 15 and 18 years old. That's why when you said one of them had a baby, I said, no! <laughs> my stepdaughter who has a baby who's 29. <laughs> and is a college professor, by the way, at 29. Mm -hmm. And she's doing her doctorate so, in journalism, so that's pretty good. Um, so, that's how you define success, and that's one of the reasons why, why I'm here. Um, so, you're not only successful, but you're also very lucky. Yes, you're lucky to be in a like Ivy League school. You're lucky to have gotten a scholarship, but you're also lucky to be a Latino. You know, I remember writing something a long time ago. I remember writing something a long time ago, and you know, I I, I didn't memorize it, but I, I was just uh, telling telling someone that I wrote uh, an essay called Latinas, and the way that I started is that. You know, when I was a little girl, they used to dress me up, and they used to make me up and put little bows. And when I got to the age where I realized, you know, I got to a certain age when I realized that it was not only my gender that made me different, but also my heritage, my cultural heritage, I realized how special I was to have been born a Latina, not just to have been born a girl. And... Really, I think, we, you know, we are so lucky to have grown up in, in, in these two cultures that come together as one. I'm sure that um, many of you, like me, grew up speaking Spanish and English in a household where we could celebrate Fourth of July and we could celebrate Cinco de Mayo, where we would have, you know, pizza parties and taquet, um, taquizas. Yeah. And, and you enjoy them both because you feel that you're so much part of these two worlds that, that come together as one. And, you know, we're also very lucky that, that our parents teach us the pride in being Latino. Um, in, in holding your head up high and saying, you know what, it doesn't matter, you know, my color, the color of my skin, the texture of my hair, and the accent in my voice uh, make me special and, and make me who I am. And we have to be proud of being Latinos. So that's the other thing I wanted to tell you, that you're very lucky and that I admire you for your success. Now I'll tell you a few stories about media, Latinos in the media. Now we'll get to it. Okay, how, how did Spanish language media uh, become so powerful? Because Spanish language media is powerful. And you know the proof of that? Is that Latinos elected President Obama. 71% of Latinos voted for President Obama, 76% of Latinas voted for President Obama. Um, how did we get, how did they gain that power? How did they gain the information? Through Spanish language media. Um, not because we told them to vote for anyone, because we don't. Because we actually um, do uh, practice balanced journalism, true balanced journalism. I want to stay away from the word objective because I don't think objectivity in the media exists anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. old now. 
Um, I think now what you strive for is balance. And I think we are balanced. And we give people the information. This is this party and this candidate and this is what they stand for. And this is the other one and this is what they, they stand for. Now, what we do tell them is go out and vote. Your voice, your vote is your voice. And things will not change if you don't vote. That we do tell them. So, you know, I, I would say that we, we can give ourselves a little bit of credit for, along with all these civic organizations and all these movements, Mi Familia Vota, Naleo, Maldiv, all these organizations together, we join forces to make sure that the Latino vote made a difference. Um, so, what happened, you know, I, you said I started 30 years ago. Actually, it was a little more, but I'm not going to say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I used to celebrate my 20th anniversary with Univision and my 25th anniversary. And then when I got to celebrate my 30th anniversary, I said, oh my God, I see a problem here. <laughs> I started when I was eight, and I'm sticking to that story. <laughs> so how did we grow? Well, we grew all together, hand in hand. When I started working at KMX Channel 34 in L.A., there were 14 million Latinos in the country. Now there's 52 million Latinos in the country. Spanish Network Television was very small. Univision, it was called Spanish International Network at the time. There was just a few stations, LA, San Antonio, uh, Miami, New York. And, you know, it wasn't really a network. It was just a few stations that were kind of linked together. And most of the programming came from Mexico. And we were considered a low, um, low quality, um, you know, low viewership, um, low voltage you know, network or, or stations that nobody watched except recently arrived immigrants. And now we have become a powerhouse where we directly compete with ABC, CBS, and NBC. Well, we get higher ratings in cities like Los Angeles and, and, and Miami, New York, than CBS, ABC, and NBC in their, news, in their newscast. Why? Because there's more, Lati more and more Latinos that are watching us. Um, so that's, we grew hand in hand. We grew not only in quantity, but in quality, um, definitely in quality as far as uh, television is concerned and as far as the sophistication of the Latino community, who is much more aware now of what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. Because I do think that, you know, when you talk about advocacy journalism, it's like, what are you doing? Are we advocating for, for a community? No, I think we're helping educate a community um, to teach them their rights. But not only the rights that they can come here and say and demand and say, I want this and I want that, but also of their responsibilities as newly arrived immigrants or as citizens of this country. And part of that civic responsibility is to participate in the electoral process. Like I always say, if you have the right to vote and you don't vote, then you don't have the moral authority to complain because you didn't vote. So keep that in mind all the time. So this is how we came to be this powerhouse. I remember when I started working at Channel 34 and I would try to get an interview with a press, with a, any presidential candidate or any politician for that matter, people would say, Channel 31, where are you from? And now, of course, you would have to explain Spanish language media and they'd say, well, you know, do we need a translator? So, you know, we speak English too, we just happen to, we just happen to broadcast in Spanish. Um, <laughs> Now, the doors of the White House are open for us, and they have been for a long time. You know, we're very privileged that President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton have been very accessible to us. And not only to do us a favor, but because now they need us. Why do they need us? Because they want to get to you and your parents. And they know that the best way to get to you and your parents and your grandparents and the rest of your, of your family members and your, is through Spanish language media. Now, why are Latinos watching Spanish language media more than English language media when the majority of Latinos are completely bilingual? It's not because of the language. It's because of the content. That's why we have become this powerhouse. Because Hispanic Latinos, bilingual Latinos know that when they watch us, they're going to get the news. They're going to know what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country, what's going on in their state, in their local communities. But they're also going to know what's going on in their countries of origin or their parents' countries of origin. And they're also going to know about issues that you're never going to see on ABC, CBS, and NBC. And if you do, such as immigration or immigration-related issues, and if you do, it will be with a completely different slant than you will in, in, in Univision or Telemundo. I should say that too. But yeah, I happen to work for Univision, so I have to... <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know, most of um, most of the people that work at the Lumunda came from Univision anyway, so we're all a big family. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a mean thing to say, it's true. <laughs> they're my friends, they're my friends and, and, and they're my colleagues. So, you know, that's how Spanish language media grew and became to be a powerhouse. But that's how the Hispanic community also grew. And I think we helped each other, you know. We had a role in helping develop the Latino community by giving them the information they needed to become this powerhouse that they have. And Latinos helped us grow by being more and more demanding and more sophisticated viewers and more sophisticated voters than ever before. So now the Latino community is has so much influence. I don't even know if you understand how much influence we have. All you need to do is look around you everywhere. Um, you see it in music. <laughs> what are people listening to in this country? They're listening to J Lo, Pitbull, Gloria Stefan, um, even with Cindy Yandel. And there's all these <laughs> there's all these kind of singers now that want to record with the reggaetoneros because hey, hey, there's something going on here because these people are you know are so popular. Um, we're influential in in food. You know now salsa sells, sells more than ketchup and tortillas sell more than than, than, than bagels. Um, we're influential in, in, in government, uh, where there's more and more Latinos being elected to to office across the country and having big, big inf a big, big influence. Now that I have my bottle of water here, like Marco Rubio. Um, there's a perfect example of how a young immigrant became so powerful that he became the first Hispanic to ever deliver uh, the speech for the opposing party in a uh, for the Republican Party in um, right after the State of the Union, and he did it in Spanish also. It had never been done in Spanish, so you know we should be very proud of that. Whether you agree or disagree with his with his uh, policies, we need to be very proud of that. I have to tell you why it was such a big deal. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know, but this is my version of why it was such a big deal. I, I've interviewed many presidents, as, as you heard. And they always have a glass of water, always. You have the chair, and then they put a little table next to it. Obama always has it. <laughs> and a nice glass of water. And anytime he wants to, he can pick up the glass and drink. But I don't know about um, Marco Ibro staffers, but they put the water here. <laughs> and they put it in a bottle. So of course, if he got thirsty, there's nothing wrong with drinking water when you're giving a speech. But when you get thirsty and you have to go like this <laughs> to make sure that you don't miss the teleprompter cue, then it's really bad. <laughs> so, you know, I would, I would reprimand his staff or whoever did that to him because that was not very nice. <laughs> not very nice. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being thirsty, Marco. <laughs> You know, uh, a little while ago, some of you were at Laura's um, uh, presentation, and she mentioned how uh, the Latino community is also changing the media because they, there's so much attention now to who are these people. Actually, when it, when it was in 2000, after the census came in, that they saw such a surge in the census show, such a surge in the Latino community that uh, King Features called me and said, you know, we're interested in having you do a syndicated column because there's a lot of newspapers uh, uh, out there who are saying, who are these people? You know, now we have all these Hispanics that are growing in, in, in some states where, that were not the traditional states where Latinos live, you know, Illinois, Texas, California, New York, Florida, in, in South Carolina and in Oklahoma and in all these different states, the Latino community was growing by leaps and bounds and that's, that's how they called me and asked me to, to be a syndicated columnist. And, and just as you said, now you see so many big uh, newspapers buying Spanish language newspapers. You see the synergy between networks and Spanish language media, such as NBC and Telemundo, such as um, Fox that now has Mundo Fox, such as ABC that now has joined forces with Univision to create a new network that it is expected to be the first of its kind, it will be the first of its kind, catering to young Latinos or second and third generation Latinos who are dominant in English but are interested in having that angle uh, as part of their information uh, where they can culturally identify 
with the information there. So that network is hiring a lot of Latinos, a lot of English-speaking Latinos, which is the first time that you see this. Yes, we have some representation in the media, but very little. You can, I think, you know, name in one hand the anchors, and not even main anchors, but people who are in, in who have a, a prominent position in in television um, that are Hispanic. John Quinones is one of them. Elizabeth Vargas is one of them. Soledad O'Brien is the other. And there's a couple of reporters, I think, on CNN that are that are Latinos too. There's not that many. Um, so, mm -hmm. what needs to happen? I think uh, Laura said it best. Now they're beginning to realize just how influential Latinos are. So it's very possible that pretty soon you'll be hearing in ABC, CBS, NBC, and maybe some of uh, of the cable networks uh, accents in Spanish or faces that are a little bit browner or you know hair that's <laughs> darker, uh, because if they don't want to lose out on that audience, then they're going to have to do something to change it. And, and, it, and it is happening, and it's happening all over, all, over this, all over the country. Look at how many publications are now printed in Spanish. Um, and not only news publications, but fashion magazines are now everywhere in, in Latin America and here. People in Espanol, um, Vogue in Espanol, uh, cosmopolitan in Espanol. You know, you have all of these. So they are putting their, you know, their money, they're investing in in this community because why? Because they know that it's going to pay back. Because Latinos are here to stay. Because Latinos are part of this society. We're an integral part of the society. And there's got to come a time where we stop saying it's us against them. Because who's us then? And who is them? You know, we are Americans, we're hyphenated Americans, and there will always be hyphenated Americans. There's nothing wrong with it. We're, Latino, uh, we're Latinos or, or Hispanic American, just like there are African American and Jewish American and Italian American, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a hyphenated American. You're not any less American because you happen to have, you know, pride in your, in your cultural heritage. So Latinos are here to stay, and Latinos will be the majority pretty soon. You know that by 2000... 50, Latinos will be 30% of the population. That's a lot. And <laughs> yeah. this, we're a very young population. Median age for Latinos is 27 years old. I don't know if you know this, but every 30 seconds in this country, a Latino turns 18 and becomes a voting adult. So we're growing <laughs> by leaps and bounds. Every 30 seconds, a Latino turns 18. So we are growing <laughs> fast, yes, like that. That's how fast we're growing, exactly. Um, and that's why, that's why it's so important for you guys to be here. Because, you know, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but the future of this country is in your hands. Because if we have this um, sector, sector of the population that is growing so fast, and this sector of the population is not educated, what can we expect? We have to prepare our youth to be able to handle the challenges that you know life will you know will, will grant not only us and our families but this country. And this is a very if right now it's competitive. Imagine what it's going to be like in in, in 2050. And you want to have um, las herramientas. I, I hate to say uh, las armas porque eso suena muy feo. Las herramientas que necesitan, not the weapons, but you want to have you know what it takes to be able to succeed, what it takes to, to, to be able to stand out uh, in your different fields, whatever field that you decide. But you are, and it's definitely true. It's not just that the youth is the future of America, the Latino youth is the future of America. Now, is there is there a future in the media? Because, you know, I know that you have been focusing a lot on, on, on Latinos in the media. Yes, because of all the reasons that I told you, there definitely is future um, um, for Latinos in the media, in both English and in Spanish. When I started working for KMEX many years ago, people would say, why don't you switch over to English language media? Because Latinos are going to assimilate and there won't be a job for you in the future. And, and I, you know, 30 years later, I say, ha ha, look, <laughs> now there's 52 million of us. And the thing is that Latinos have assimilated. but where they're mistaken is that they think that assimilation means leaving behind your culture and your language, and it doesn't. It means adopting a new one. It means being uh, a Hispanic American and proud to be American and proud to be Hispanic. So here we are. And I, you know, put, I believe so much in the future 
of, uh, of Latinos in the media that I put my money where my mouth is. And I provide a scholarship through the National Association of Hispanic Journalists for Latinos who want to pursue a career in, in journalism, uh, regardless of, of their legal status. So I do put my money where my mouth is. I want to learn a little bit about all of you. Now, you ask me any questions that you want. But first, I, I know that most of you are from the Southwest, correct? Woo! How many are from California? Woo! Where else? Um, Arizona? 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 Nevada? One from Nevada? Ay, Dios. 